Hello, this is Larry Wilson, and I would like to welcome you to the 10th tape in our 209 series titled Shadows of God. Today we will be discussing uh, the book of Isaiah starting at chapter 14, and this is the fourth tape in the book, on the book of Isaiah. And in the studio with me here today is my partner in crime, and in all matters of righteousness, David <laughs> Brooks. Welcome, David. Uh, good to be here. It's always a lot of fun to get together and to study the Bible and to examine what is uh, written in its pages. And uh, today we're going to pick up with um, the discovery of the devil. I'd like to make a few introductory remarks just to get uh, our listeners wound up for the delivery the book of Isaiah is written, Isaiah begins his ministry around 731 B.C. or 739 B.C. And um, Isaiah is the first book in the Bible to really say anything other than the book of Job uh, about the origin of the devil. And his plan? Yes, and his works. Uh, Moses wrote, as you know, the book of Job, and that is, I should say, that is generally believed that Moses wrote the book of Job. And um, so Moses lived about 700 years before Isaiah. And we are approximately... Um, 3,300 years since creation when Isaiah is writing. And we are learning 3,300 years into world history information about the devil that has been previously unknown. Why do you think God did it this way? Why is there no clear expression and statements about the origin of the devil, about the adversary of man, about the means through which he works, about the uh, evil that lurks in spiritual places. Why do you suppose we have no information on this until we get to Isaiah? Well, the only guess I would be willing to hazard is that back in these days, a lot of history was oral. And you have to admit that there, for a long time, there were people who actually lived uh, at the fall. Adam was able to be an eyewitness to, sheesh, how many tens of thousands of people about what had happened. Well, he did and, live to be 930 years of right. age. So, so there, there were lots of people that he could tell, and there were people who, who knew him all the way up to Noah, and I'm sure Noah uh, was able to transmit on some of the stories about what happened to him and, and what had happened previous to the flood. So for eyewitness accounts, I guess there was no lack of witnesses. Uh, as far as the written account, uh, I, I really don't have a good explanation as to why um, there isn't a written account about what Satan does and how he does it and where he came from. The Bible really doesn't say a great deal in open and direct ways about the devil until we get to the New Testament. Paul tells us about the man of sin. John in Revelation tells us about the Antichrist and also in, in his epistles there, 1 John. Um, Jesus tells us about the prince of this world. Now, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Job are the only three books in the Bible that I can recall at this time. That Well, maybe the book of Daniel, um, which expresses anything at all about the operation, the presence, and the uh, attack 
that Satan is endeavoring um, to bring against the works of God upon earth. Of course, in the book of Genesis, you know, we have the introduction of the serpent, his seed and the woman's seed. Um, so there is a clue. But um, the, the whole subject of Lucifer, the fallen adversary of God, is, is a mystery. And uh, one has to work at it a little bit in order to begin to pull the pieces together. But, and this is an emphatic but, the subject becomes primary in its importance because the Antichrist is the devil himself and he is going to be allowed to physically appear on earth as a glorious being just as Christ became a human being and appeared on earth. When I tell people uh, on my radio uh, show that God is going, that the Antichrist is the devil incarnate, that he is going to physically appear, people just can't believe that the Antichrist is something that we can't even see at this time. They want the Antichrist to be a man born somewhere in Europe or, you know, some other uh, organization or entity that can be touched, you know, heard from, seen, listened to uh, in, in our reality. And yet they're willing to accept that uh, Jesus Christ did. Uh, he came out of heaven's reality mm -hmm. and stepped into ours. Yeah, but, but it's so difficult for them to believe that, that Satan could step into our reality too. Yes. And which doesn't make a lot of sense when you stop and think about it. If one can, surely the other one can too. Jesus, in coming into our reality, came through the womb. Right. Through the Virgin Mary. Uh, Lucifer, when he steps into our reality, will come in the clouds of glory. He does not come through the womb as one of us. He will come trying to uh, convince people that he's the king of kings and lord of lords. He will, that's correct. In he, all of his glory. He will imitate the second coming. He will come down, according to Revelation, he comes down out of the sky with his angels attending him. The glory will be unlike anything ever witnessed by human beings. And he will deceive, if possible... The very elect. Now, the one distinction, actually two distinctions between the appearing of Satan and the appearing of Christ, is first, timing. Satan appears in the fifth trumpet. Christ appears in the seventh bowl or the seventh vial. Timing is a big issue. Second, when Lucifer appears, he will not be seen the world over at the same time. When Christ comes, every eye will see him. As Christ approaches earth, now I realize we don't, aren't studying Revelation today, but in my hand here, I'm holding a, a globe of the earth, and the earth rotates in a counterclockwise direction. The sun, which is stationary out here in space, um, as our earth rotates, this gives the appearance of the sun rising in the east because of the rotation of the earth. So the east coast will approach the sun before, of course, the west coast due to the nature of our rotation. As Christ approaches the earth, and uh, I believe that his approach is on the order of about 45 days. So there will be plenty of time for everybody all the way around the world to see him. It will be a crescendo. It will be a growing anticipation. It will be, uh, for the saints, a moment of, of immense interest and joy. It will be, for the wicked, an immense time of anticipation and dread. 
And they'll probably be preparing to try to destroy this being as it comes in. Oh, yes. And uh, so as Christ comes in to the earth and the earth is rotating in its counterclockwise direction, every eye will see him. There will be plenty of notif- notice, plenty of, of things to see, the heavens in convulsion, the, the starts out as a small cloud, and as it draws nearer, it keeps getting larger and larger and larger. And uh, the fire within and the violence within the clouds will be seen. So the coming of Christ will be a global observation, whereas the appearing of the devil will be local. The devil will appear and he will land. That's right. He's going to come out of the clouds and land upon the earth and walk upon the ground. This is unlike Jesus because Jesus, you know, calls the righteous dead out of their graves. And Paul says, then we which are alive and remain are caught up with them in the air to meet the Lord. And that's, uh, that's one trick Satan just can't pull God, off. God does not allow the devil to imitate that. But, but, it, but, but if you're not familiar with the Bible and familiar with the distinctions about what Christ can do and what Lucifer can do, you're going to be deceived about this whole thing. This is the critical point. Jesus warns in Matthew 24, there will be false prophets and false Christs that will arise and deceive many. But he says, as the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. The coming of Christ will engulf the entire world. The coming of Satan will be local. He will appear in New York. He will appear in Moscow, Mexico City, Sydney, Australia. He will appear in various times and in various ways to the people of earth, but on a local basis. He'll be performing miracles right, um, in an effort to make sure everyone understands who, he, who he's trying to be. He will put on, as Ed Sullivan used to say, a really big show. <laughs> <laughs> I think his accent was a little bit different. Well, I just, I, <laughs> I just, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not from New York, so what can I say? Uh, the, the idea right is... Right here on our show. <laughs> <laughs> um, the devil will do uh, will be granted authority by God to produce this enormous display uh, to a deceive the world and take it captive, and b to lead the world into total and full military rebellion against the sovereignty of God. And God allows the, this singularly because people refused to love the truth and so be saved. And Paul says, and for this reason, that is the reason that they, re, you know, of rebellion, God will send them a strong delusion that they will believe the lie and be condemned. Now, Isaiah gives us some very important information in the the 8th century B.C. that does not find its fulfillment until after the 7th millennium has been completed and time comes for the destruction of Lucifer. Uh, Isaiah gives us language that we need to, you know, we don't speak and understand language today like the Old Testament times. Therefore, it takes a bit of study to understand the, what, the use of language and the use of phrases and their meaning to be able to bring them into our time period. You've often heard me say you can't read the Bible wearing Nikes. You have to go back and put on the sandals and understand their language. So Genesis introduces the devil. Job says a little bit about 
the devil. Isaiah tells us about the origins and the reasons for his expulsion from heaven. Ezekiel tells us about his arrogance and his rebellion against God. Daniel tells us about the devil's enmity against the will of God, the plans of God. And that's it from the Old Testament. Later, the New Testament brings all the pieces together for us. So, when we're looking at Isaiah 14, actually the, the, the passage that uh, is called Isaiah 14 began in chapter 13 as a taunt against the king of Babylon. And this uh, taunt uh, continues, this oracle, this prophecy against the real king of Babylon uh, is, is uh, mentioned here in verse 3 and 4. Um, and what it speaks of is the king of Babylon coming to his end. And when this happens, the, res the response of mankind, when they see it. Now, remember... This is written at a time when Babylon is uh, becoming a powerful nation. In, in the 730 uh, B.C. time period, Babylon is not the world empire that it later becomes under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar. Nabopolassar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's father, was instrumental in the 40 years prior to 605 B.C. of bringing and, and gathering up the authority of Babylon as, a, as, a, as an empire. When uh, Nebuchadnezzar became a ruler, he was able to quickly solidify his support and established himself as the king of the world. Um, we are a hundred years away from Nebuchadnezzar when this is being written. The interesting point is Babylon is growing, Babylon is beginning to develop, and Babylon is going to play a very important role in the prophecies of Isaiah. But Babylon also plays a very important role at the end of time. Spiritual Babylon. Well, physical Babylon we're going to have a crisis government at the end time that will form in response to the judgments of God. And this crisis government will speak and, and enact laws, and, and it will be literal. It will be literal Babylon. Um, the reason I believe it is written this way is because of plan A, plan B. God having foreknowledge, God having understanding and knowing the end from the beginning, he writes this in such a way that it will play out and deliver the message either way uh, circumstances should unfold. And it's interesting, he always gives us what we need just before we need it. Yes. Here it is, he's, uh, he's giving this information about the devil Mm -hmm. before the Israelites need it, and uh, we can also apply this when we need it. That's the reason that it's imperative to understand plan A and plan B and the distinction and the operation of the two. Because if you don't, things will get so muddy and confusing that you can't tell where we're going and what God is trying to say. So when God is talking about the real king of Babylon, the real prince of this world, and how he is going to come to his end, Paul says he's going to go to his destruction, um, the significance in both cases, the parallel in both cases is identical. It's the timing and the actual fulfillment that is different in how it actually plays out. The, the man of sin 
is going to come to, to his destruction. In the book of Daniel, the horn power in Daniel 8 that comes out of the north and uh, he's the king who understands dark sentences, a master of intrigue. That's the devil. And it always says he goes to his destruction. And this, the, is, this is a favorite yes, phrase. Yes. He goes to his destruction. And it says so in Revelation 17. Mm -hmm. The beast that comes up out of the abyss is going to his destruction. The reason this is reiterated over and over and over and over again is because from the human perspective, he will be invincible. From the human perspective, he cannot be stopped. He cannot be thwarted. He cannot be overcome. He militarily uh, is too great. Yeah. How would you go about getting your hands on Satan? How would you do that? How would you, you know? kill him? Yeah. Uh, is an atomic bomb going to kill the devil? No. You can't even find him. Well, he can disappear in a heartbeat well, well, and jump sure. up in the clouds, or he can grab the missile and throw it back at you. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> you, we have the oncoming, and, and this is the critical point. We have this oncoming being, uh, both under plan A and plan B, and plan B uh, who is omnipotent from the human perspective. Right. And man cannot prevent it, man cannot stop it, man cannot control it, man cannot do anything. The only hope we have is in our faith in Jesus Christ to protect us from this. Well, actually, the only hope mankind has is that God destroys him. Right. Otherwise, because, we're going to have to put up because, with this guy because, for a long time. Because he can't, there's no other way for him to come to his end. Right. Angels can't do it. I would, I would remind you that in Daniel 8 it says, and he will come to his end, but not by human power. Right. See, that, we, we, words fail me <laughs> to put this in the omnipotent setting that it deserves. Well, when you consider the fact that Satan is still alive from from the beginning of creation, I mean of, yeah. of of God's creation, Adam has died. Yeah, you know, you know, Daniel and and Ezekiel and Isaiah and 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 Peter and Paul, they've all died, but the devil was there during each lifetime. Yes, watching what happened, planning, scheming, setting things up. He's had an awful lot of time to figure this stuff out. So it comes. It should come as no surprise when when you find out what he can do to you, and you don't even know what he's what he's doing until it's done. In the book of Ezekiel, the king named Gog, G O G, who is the prince of Magog, which is a land mass a territory. In the book of Ezekiel, God is going to bring Gog leading a host of nations against his people. Flip over to Ezekiel chapter 38 and uh, let me highlight I realize we're digressing from the book of Isaiah. Um, we, ne we may never finish this <laughs> series, David. It just gets better and better. It just keeps, it? Um, there's so much to, to say. Ezekiel chapter 38. Okay, how far you want to go? Well, I'm just going to pick up a few things I want you to see. On the first, uh, chapter, first two verses. Yes. Yeah. This is a prophecy against Gog. It's interesting in English how that it's so close to the name God. Gog, mm -hmm. God. <laughs> uh, this person, Gog, under plan A, would have been the Antichrist. This person, Gog, would have been the devil incarnate. This person in Ezekiel 38 would have been the equivalent of what happens in the fifth trumpet under plan B. And uh, he's the chief prince of this territory, Meshach and Tubal. 
And uh, the prophecy goes, this is what the sovereign Lord says, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Now, he says here, jump down uh, to verse uh, 7. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. See, what, what's going to take place is Gog is going to come up against Jerusalem and he's going to have all of the armies of the earth under his command. Does that sound like plan B at the end of the thousand years? Mm, just it, like it. And that's why John says in Revelation 20, and the devil and the wicked came upon the city, Gog, Gog and Magog. I mean, he, he, John clearly tells us what this is. Well, you know, what this actually ultimately means is no matter which route you take, you're going to get to the same destination if you follow Satan. Yeah. It, it just doesn't matter. Uh, you may go through three or four different routes. There could be a plan C, D, and E, but no matter what, you're going to wind up trying to assault Jerusalem before it's all over with. That's you're, you're, either, you're either going to be within or without. Or without. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Everybody. Chapter 39 starts off exactly the same way. I mean, yes. it's... Uh, yes. Notice, go back, to, go back to verse 7, though, in 38. Get ready, God is saying. Be prepared, Gog. You and all the hordes gathered about you and take command of them. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war. Now, what's he talking about under plan A? Who is going to be restored to their homeland? That'd be the Israelites. And according to the promises that we have read in Obadiah and Joel and in Jonah and elsewhere, God is going to restore his people. From all nations. Yes. And so God is going to bring this great horde of nations led by Gog, you and verse 9, you and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up advancing like a storm and you will be a cloud, like a cloud, covering the land. So, therefore, verse uh, 14, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. In that day, when my people Israel are living in safety, will you not take notice of it? You will come from your place where? In the far north. Now It's always from the north. This is critical because, you see, destruction, divinely appointed destruction, always comes from the north. This is a critical under point to understand. Um, destruction in, in Isaiah chapter 1 is coming upon Israel from the north. I, uh, destruction, and it's in the form of the Babylonians. But the Babylonians actually live in the east. Babylon is east, not north. But it's described as coming out of the north. The reason it's described as coming out of the north is because in the Old Testament times, the, the earth was flat. And the northern point of the compass always pointed up. East was to the right, and north was always to the top part of the map. And the northern boundary of Israel's territory was the river Euphrates. The river Euphrates comes out of Turkey, flows through Syria, and down into Iraq. So the Babylonians had to cross the northern border, which is the river Euphrates. Now, when Babylon finally gets powerful, and after it has punished Israel, guess where the Medes and the Persians come from? According to Jeremiah, they come out of the north. They have to cross the same river. They have to cross the same river. The point is, is that um, the devil and his troops are coming out of the north, the source of divine judgment. And uh, God says, you will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people, Israel, like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, O Gog, 
I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me. And when I show myself holy through you before their eyes, God is going to bring Lucifer and all of his followers with him into military conflict, and God will show who is superior and who actually is sovereign. And it's interesting to look at the weapons he'll use. He won't be using man-made nuclear weapons or anything like that to defeat Gog. No, no. Verse 18 says, When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord, and in my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, and uh, all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, moved out of their places. The cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. And verse 22, God says, I will execute judgment upon Gog with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur. Under plan B, that's exactly how it happens. <laughs> well, God is at least consistent, isn't he? This is, um, this is wonderful to understand that God has a plan. If Israel had been faithful, if they had turned from their rebellion, if enough people had surrendered their lives to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that corporate reformation could take place. This could have all happened many centuries ago under plan A. But guess what? Nobody was faithful. Precious few. This is a point that I want to make, David, and I think our listeners need to seriously consider it. Under plan A, God provides and allows for man's participation. Under plan B, God unilaterally does what has to be done. It's the only way it's going to get done. Under plan A, I'll give you an example. God led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the wilderness. Under plan A, he wanted to take them within two years, into the promised land. So they sent in the 12 spies, you know, to spy mm -hmm. out the land. They came back, and they gave a bad report. Then God said, very well, very well, then you'll stay here and die. And the end result is that God set the limit. He said, for 40 years, a day for a year, you're going to wander about in the wilderness. And God did not date the 40 years, and interestingly, God did not date the 40 years from the failure at Kadesh Barnea. God dated the 40 years from the Exodus because it's 38 more years from Kadesh Barnea till the time they enter the promised land. My point is, is that under plan B, and I'm using plan A and plan B on a local level here, plan A, the first generation that comes out, is supposed to go in to the promised land. They failed. They had to die. And when time came to go in, ready or not, here we go. You understand what, right. I'm, what right. I'm saying? Somebody is going in. The, 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 the same is also true of what I'm about to say. We cannot hasten the second coming. Nor delay it. Nor delay it. It will happen. Under plan B, time. under plan B, there is no haste nor delay. In fact... Turn to Revelation chapter uh, 9. And I, I'd like for you to read um, verse 15. And the four angels who had been kept ready for this very hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of the mounted troops was 200 million. I heard the number. So, in, in the sixth trumpet, the four angels at the great river Euphrates um, are released. Euphrates is the northern boundary. 
destruction destruction comes from the north comes out of the north divine destruction divinely appointed destruction comes out of the north and the and the four angels who have been kept ready for this very hour day month and year how more specific do you have to be that's punctilier <laughs> it means at this very predestined point, predecreed point in time predetermined point in time yeah now, that sixth trumpet cannot be more than 59 minutes off <laughs> because the resolution of time just goes to the very hour, right. day, month, and year. Right. God's timing in this second round under plan B, the end time story, is absolute. It's perfect. And it's going to happen whether you're ready or not. That's how I know that when it comes time for the Sabbath millennium, Jesus will be here. And, and from my study of the scriptural uh, timing considerations, the Jubilee calendar and all of the things that are involved, we're in that window of where the 6,000th year can occur. The 6,000th year can occur any time between 1998 and the year 2017, as I understand the timing. We're in that window. Now, understand that we have the 1,335 days of the Great Tribulation yet mm -hmm. ahead of us. Right. So that would mean that if we started right now, here we are in the fall of 1999. Today is September the 1st, 1999. If the Great Tribulation started today, 1,335 days from now would put us right at the year 2004, Jan around somewhere. It's three years and eight months, not quite four years. So maybe it would put us about the August or June of uh, 2003 if it started this very day. God's timing is, is um, amazing. He delivered the children of Israel 430 years to the very day. Remember reading that in Exodus 1241? Mm -hmm. To the very day yep. he delivered them. Well, uh, when it came time to write the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, it was written on the very day that it had to be the first day of the first month of the, of the first year of the Jubilee cycle. Uh, when it came time for the birth of Christ, at the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, Galatians 4.4. 4. Jesus died right on the very time as the sacrificial lamb was being killed downtown Jerusalem at the temple. The lamb of God died on Golgotha. God's timing is, is incredibly uh, powerful. Nothing can slow it. Nothing can thwart it. Nothing can delay it nor can it be hastened. It's an amazing thing to understand. It's an awesome thing to, to deal with. So in Ezekiel, I mean, when you really begin to put all the data together, today we have a profoundly wonderful picture of what God intends to do. Under plan A, if Israel had been faithful, they, too, could have understood these things. But they had eyes that couldn't see and ears that couldn't hear. Just like today. Just like today. Now, back to Isaiah 14, verse 4. The righteous will take up this taunt against the real king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end. How his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod, the ruling scepter of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued nations with relentless aggression. All the lands are at rest and at peace. They break into singing. Even the pine trees and the cedars of Lebanon exalt over you and say, Now that you, O king of Babylon, 
have been laid low. No woodsman comes to cut us down. So everything is at peace now. You know, isn't it amazing, though, to see how, how the, the devil has, has treated people? Uh, anger, he has struck down people with unceasing blows. You know, we've seen scenes of violence on television during riots and looting and things like that, and, and people just taking sticks and baseball bats and just beating each other. But it'll usually hit three or four times, and then something happens, and somebody's down. But then here it says unceasing blows. He's just beating on people all the time. He never quits. Uh, Look at re- ver- re- relentless aggression. Yes. His his fury knows no bounds. His his hatred, his evil, his determination knows no boundary. And how discouraging can that be when you've got a bully like this who's beating you up and there's nothing you can do about it, you can't make him go away, and nobody is big enough to beat him. Uh, If any of you have ever been in elementary school and there was a bully in the fourth grade that used to beat you up, and and you, you simply could not get away from this guy. It simply was not possible. The teachers couldn't help you because he always did it when they weren't looking. And uh, it just went on and on and on. That's what's happening here. Yes. And finally, at some point in time, it'll all be over. Look at verse 9. There's an interesting allusion here that um, the careless reader would just fly right over and, and miss entirely. It says, The grave below is all a stir to meet you at your coming. So that means he's mortal at some point in time. Yes, yes, he's mortal. I'm looking for a passage here. I want to I want to show you something. Turn to Isaiah twenty six, verse nineteen. Read that verse, please. But your dead will live, their bodies will rise. You who dwell in the dust, wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. This is a prophetic passage that is in full harmony with what is given in the book of Ezekiel, how that God is going to raise up Israel. He's going to resurrect the dead. And David is going to reign on his throne, King David. Under plan A, there was going to be a resurrection of all the righteous, just like there is obviously in plan Mm -hmm. B. And Isaiah is abundantly clear. The earth will give birth to her dead. I think that is so beautiful. And and you know, in, in Christ's time, there was such an argument as to whether there is a resurrection or not. The sad you sees were sad, you see, <laughs> because they believed in no resurrection. Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Of course, Paul used this to his advantage when he got in a fight with both of them. Mm-hmm. The point I'm making is that back in chapter 14, verse 9, the grave below is all astir to meet you at your coming. The wicked would have been resurrected under plan A, just like plan B. The, the grave, the graves of the wicked, all the wicked are going to be resurrected at the end of the thousand years so that they can, A, see the holy city, B, they can meet their maker face to face, and C, they can understand and see why they are not included in the holy city. God reveals to each person what um, hit the judgment was all about and what his sentence will be. And they can see the results of their, of, the, of their choices. That's right. And they will also, you know, they're resurrected to, to provide restitution for the suffering they've caused. Mm-hmm. All the grave is a stir to meet you at your coming. The wicked at the end of the thousand years will not only see God, they will see the devil. Well, it's time to turn the tape over. We'll take a short intermission and we'll be right back. Well, welcome back to the second half in our fourth study on the book of Isaiah. 
This is actually tape number 10 in the series, the 209 series, titled Shadows of God. David and I have been discussing um, Isaiah 14, and I've taken quite a bit of uh, time on this particular chapter because of the potency of this chapter as it relates to everyone who is living right now. Many people have diminished the importance of the Old Testament, thinking that it is merely a historical record of the failures of Israel and its ultimate apostasy and rebellion. And most Christians today believe that the God of the New Testament is quite different than the God of the Old. This will all change when the Great Tribulation begins. The book of Isaiah is fundamentally important in understanding the ways of God. This is not, uh, this is not optional to the Christian. To understand the behavior of God, we need a large slice of time to see what God does in various situations and circumstances. When we have a large sampling of time and we see God's response, then our understanding of his behavior, of what pleases him and what displeases him, and how he acts and reacts, our comprehension of righteousness begins to grow uh, in proportion to that understanding. Many, go ahead. That, that should be fairly easy to understand when you think of uh, starting a new job with a new boss. The more time you put in with that boss and, and the more time you put in with the job, the more you understand what that person expects and what you can expect of them and how the thing works. And uh, I, think, I think perhaps Adam, with his 900-plus years, had a real good view of, of how evil worked and how God worked to try to hold it off. We're living 70-plus years occasionally, and uh, uh, it may be harder for us in 70 years to understand what's going on. But if we've got the written Word of God with the historical perspective, knowing that God doesn't change, then if you look at how, if God doesn't change, then what did? It's us. It's Satan. We get the chance to see what the fruits of Satan's behavior is, what the fruit of our behavior is, and then what the fruit of God's behavior is. Yes, yes. This is why the, we're doing this series of tapes. I have felt for many years that the Old Testament uh, prophets put so much on the table for us to understand about God. And most of the time, when Old Testament prophets are referred to or quoted uh, by preachers today, um, I shouldn't say most, but I'll say much of the time, it's out of context. They rush around and pick up a verse here or there and miss, really, the context of the time the terms and conditions under which these things were said, to, to whom they were said, and under what circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, one last thing, and then, and then we'll move on from um, Isaiah chapter 14. I mean, we could spend several days talking about what is said here in this one chapter. Um, in verse 16... Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth? The man who made the world a desert? Who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home? It is clear from this passage that Satan ultimately gets to be identified and recognized as a man. 
He's actually the man of sin or the man of lawlessness. In verse 10, the people, when they see the devil, they're going to say, you have also become weak as we are. You have become like us, vulnerable to death. That's the reference here. See, ultimately, Satan's omnipotent appearance and his sovereign authority, he claims to be king of kings and lord of lords, but um, it's a false title. It's easy to talk the talk, but it's harder to walk the walk. Yes. And when he is shown to be subject to death, see, all of a sudden people are going to regard him like themselves. The wicked will say, he is like us, subject to death and about to meet his destruction. God says here in verse uh, 20, the last part, the offspring of the wicked will never be mentioned again. They'll just never exist anymore. That's right. They will be destroyed. Verse 22, I will cut off from Babylon her name and survivors, her offspring and descendants. And in the Jewish economy, it was very important to have descendants in order to occupy the land. Well, without, without children, there was no nation. Well, without children, there, there was no keeping the land in the family. That's right. To whom would it go? Right. I'd like to jump down to verse 26. This is the plan, the Bible says, God speaking, determined for the whole world. For this is the hand stretched out over all nations. For the Lord Almighty has purposed, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? God has a plan. God has a purpose. Evolution denies all of this. Evolution denies that there is a God who created man and has a plan for man. And because God's plan is longer and larger than one lifespan, this has led many since the beginning and until the end to deny there is a plan. But those who came forth at the beginning and those who will live at the end will, will, will both agree there is a plan. And that plan will be seen. Okay, let's go on to chapter 15. And uh, 15 and 16, I'm not going to deliberate uh, very long. I just want to point out that now we're going to begin a, a, a prophecy against Moab. And the Moabites are distant relatives of the Israelites. The Moabites, you might recall their origin. They are the descendants of Lot through his daughters. And uh, there was contempt and hatred between the Moabites and the Israelites uh, for generations. They were enemies. And the um, end of the world not only includes the nation of Israel, it includes all nations. And so God is speaking through Isaiah to the Moabites. Well, to, uh, to several countries. As a matter of fact, yes. I, was, I was trying to count the number of countries. You've got Assyria. Uh, Egypt. You've got Egypt. You've got the Philistines. You've got Moab. The right, Egyptians. That, four. Then you've got Damascus. What is it? Is, is that a separate country? That's the, well, at the time of this, Damascus is the head of Syria. All right. Then you've got Cush. Yes, that's Egypt. All right. Then we have um, Babylon. Yes. We have Arabia. Yes. What about Edom? We've Edom. got Edom here. The Edomites. Then mm -hmm. we have Tyre. Tyre. And that looks like that's it. How many is that? It's a handful. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, I I was, what, what I was going to be interested in seeing is if it was ten. Oh, 
Oh, I, I hadn't, I hadn't even uh, stopped to count them. Yeah, I was, I was wondering if, if it worked out to be ten because uh, there are, there are, are ten entities at the end of time. Mm -hmm. ten, you know, ten kings. And I was wondering if there oh, were going to be ten here. Well, that's an excellent idea. And uh, well, we'll have to research we'll have to that, a, that a little yeah. later on. There's another thought about Satan that intrigued me about this. Uh, Satan is usually referred to one who is not seen, is seen, is not seen. Will be seen. Uh, will be seen, mm -hmm. and, and, and terms like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a, a, a text where Jesus is referred to in the same way. Yes, yes, that's correct. And uh, I, don't, I can't put my finger on it right now, but I thought it was so interesting to have a, a Christ and an Antichrist that are that are are described in similar terms. I thought that was very intriguing as I was studying this earlier, and I wish I had written that down so I could bring it to your attention right here. The uh, text that you may be referring to um, is maybe I don't know if this is it, but it's in Revelation, and um, let me see if I can put my finger on it here. The Description of Jesus, um, he is the one, I'm trying to remember, in one of the churches, he is given this identity as the one who was and is the one who is and is to come. Mm -hmm. Seemed like it was somewhere around the scroll and the lamb taking the scroll. But yeah, well, it's here, it's here in Revelation uh, 2 or 3. Chapter two or three, okay. and um, um, well, anyway, I, I I found it was very interesting that 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 the two main protagonists mm -hmm. in the controversy yes. are referred to in the same yes. way. Yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. To me, it's another parallel to show that the Antichrist is Satan as opposed to some human being that is uh, is being put forth yes. by by some organization as being the the Antichrist. Yes. Uh, go to Isaiah chapter 16. I'm not going to go through the language of chapter 15. Uh, it's beautiful poetry. It, uh, and, and one needs to read it because it, it gives us a taste of how language and expressions are used. And uh, which are used um, hundreds of times in the New Testament. But in chapter 16... Um, Look at verse 4. Let the Moabite fugitives stay with you. Be their shelter from the destroyer. The destroyer. The coming destroyer. The oppressor will come to an end. And destruction will cease. The aggressor will vanish from the land. In love, a throne will be established. In faithfulness... A man will sit on it, one from the house of David, one who in judging seeks justice and speeds the cause of righteousness. Well, that sure is different from what we see, yeah. see today, isn't it? Yes. Here in the midst of, of an oracle concerning Moab, a, a messianic, promise because get this within the Moabite families there are those that will be redeemed there will be those who will come out and separate themselves from Moab and, and we will get into that a little later on God is going to before under plan A David before God would bring Gog and Magog and all the nations against Israel 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 would be sent out into all the nations to gather the, the honest of heart, like the 144,000 will do under Plan B. It's a big missionary project. Yes. You yes. Know, the interesting thing about that is those who are sent out are not put in charge of deciding who will decide for God. All their, all their job is is to put the message out That's so, right. so that people can hear it and make their own decision. That's right. And if you, if you don't get it out there, then they don't get the right to make that decision. So I, I think it's very 
Uh, interesting that we should apply that today. We can't make the decision for somebody. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't want to be so presumptuous as to make no. a decision for no. somebody as to whether they would respond to God's call or not. Right. Well, I'm not going to bother this guy because I know he's so steeped in sin, he's mm-hmm. not going to respond. Right. Uh, how dare we be that presumptuous? That's, that's right. God alone can read the heart. Here in the last verses of Isaiah 16, God brings the oracle against Moab into very local terms. Within three years, as a servant bound by a contract would count them, Moab's splendor and all her many people will be despised and her survivors will be very few and feeble. What God is speaking of here is that Moab was about to be overrun by the king of Assyria. In his sweep through the northern portion of Israel, in which he finally eliminated, you know, the ten tribes in 722, Shalman answer the fifth, Um, Moab goes down too. This guy is the giant lawnmower of of, uh, mowing down the apostasy and the evil of the whole land. If Israel was evil, the Moabites were even more so. That's interesting. There's another three-year period of time here. Yes. Now, it's interesting. uh, it's, It's defined... As the three years, as a servant, bound by contract, would count them. In other words, the servant is going to pay attention to the timing. Well, here's the way servants counted time. Any part of a year qualifies as a year. Hmm. What did the master have to say about that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, in fact, that's that's how time was counted. It's called inclusive reckoning. If you were going to um, be an indentured servant for three years, starting now, we count this year, wherever we are in this year, as one year. So you're not counting from from September to September? No. You're counting from September to December as one year. Right. And then from January to December is a year number two. Right. Then from... January to December would be the other one. Would be the third year. Okay. That's how time, and in fact, even in the reign of kings, the ascension year in some nations is counted as year one. Even if he only comes to power in the last two weeks of the year, he he is in his second year. He got credit for the whole year. Yeah. And at the same time, the king who left office uh, or died out of office, as the case may be, (laughs) Uh, he's given credit for the whole year, too. It's, it's, it's the way the ancients reckon time. It's called inclusive reckoning. The reason I bring this up, Moab's destruction is near at hand. Uh, you know, as you can see, as a servant, it would count time. When Jesus is in the tomb for three days and three nights, it's inclusive. It's inclusive reckoning. It's as a servant would count time. It doesn't mean 72 hours. It means that any part of a day qualifies as the day. So part of Friday, Mm -hmm. all day Saturday, Mm -hmm. and part part of Sunday. Right. Okay. So the, 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 and and this is true of the Jubilee calendation. This is true. It's true throughout the Bible. Inclusive reckoning. If you take, incidentally, if you take a trip, and you leave on Monday, and you come back on Friday, the airlines will tell you that's a five-day trip. Because they count Monday, and they count Friday. It's inclusive reckoning. Well, let's don't get into the airlines too much. Those guys <laughs> drive me crazy enough as it is. Okay. There's, there's nothing you can figure out about the airlines. Okay, <laughs> Isaiah 17. Now we have moved from Moab in the last two chapters. Now we're going to Assyria. Assyria is about to receive God's wrath. And, And again, what is taking place in these chapters, God is trying to tell the nations. 
He's trying to tell Israel, he's trying to let the world know that his plans include the whole world. This is not about Israel, uniquely and selectively, exclusively. It's, this is about the entire world. Assyria may be the kingpin at the moment, but it will not always remain. God is going to deal with Damascus, which is the equivalent of Washington, D.C. So here is an oracle concerning Damascus. See, Damascus, verse 1, will no longer be a city, but will become a heap of ruins. And the cities will be deserted. The fortified city will disappear, etc., etc. You know, if you just read down through that, it's... it's basically just a condemnation of their behavior in the fact that they have forgotten God. Yes. They're not paying attention. And it's just a notation and a listing of things that's going to happen to them. Yes. I, I misspoke. I need to make a correction here. Uh, Damascus, uh, at this point in time, is the head of one of the capitals, uh, cities, of the northern ten kingdoms. The northern kingdoms, before their destruction, had a, two capitals, one in Bethel and the other in Damascus. After they were eliminated, um, then the king of Assyria uh, took possession. So we're, we, my, um, my statement there is that this is concerning Assyria. This is actually concerning the head of Samaria, or the ten tribes right now. But later it will become such. In that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. The fat of his body will waste away. In verse 7, In that day, men will look to their Maker and turn their eyes to the Holy One of Israel. They will not look to the altars, the work of their hands, and they will have no regard for the Asherah poles and the incense altars their fingers have made. In that day, their strong cities which they left because of the Israelites will be like places abandoned to thickets and undergrowth, and all will be desolation. Um, interesting in verse 12, David, Isaiah 17, 12, how that the raging of the nations, they rage like the raging sea. Oh, the uproar of the peoples, they roar like the roaring of great waters. In Bible prophecy, we find people... Waters representing people. And this is where the language starts. This is where the concept originates. The idea of the uproar of the peoples like the uproar of great waters. Although the peoples roar like the roar of surging waters, when he rebukes them, they flee away, driven before the wind like chaff on the hills, like tumbleweed before a gale. And then in the evening, sudden terror. Then... In chapter 18, we, we, this is kind of interesting. We're going to pick up the, the idea now of God bringing foreigners in to be partners with Israel. Um, remember I said like the 144,000 will go out and bring a, a great multitude out of Babylon, you know, uh, at the, just before the second coming? Mm-hmm. The second angel's message, you know, and the Revelation 18 message is come out of Babylon that you be not partakers of her sins. And Babylon being representing the whole world and the consolidation of the religious systems and all religions. Under plan A, there's the same scenario. I'd like for you to look at it here in chapter 18, Isaiah 18. Woe to the land of whirring wings. That's the wings of grasshoppers. Along the rivers of Cush, that's uh, the rivers of Egypt, which sends envoys by sea and papyrus boats over the water, go swift messengers to a people tall and smooth-skinned. Now notice they are being sent. To a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech whose land is divided by the deltas of the Nile. So God is going to send people to Cush, to the peoples of this land, 
All you people of the world, you who live on the earth, when a banner is raised on the mountains, you will see it, and when a trumpet sounds, you will hear it. And uh, the Lord is talking about, he's sending his people out, he's sending his messengers out to Egypt, and notice what the t what's going to happen in verse 7. At that time, gifts will be brought to the Lord Almighty from a people tall and smooth-skinned, from a people feared far and wide, an aggressive nation of strange speech of whose land is divided by rivers. The gifts will be brought to Mount Zion, the place of the name of the Lord Almighty. Now, what is he describing? A missionary success. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's interesting how he, re, he reiterates the description of the people so there can be no mistake as the, to who he's talking about. Many, honest of heart, sincere of heart, would be gathered out of Egypt and brought to Israel. Out of any country. Out of all yes. countries. Well, yes. Yeah. Uh, we just, uh, here in Isaiah yeah. 18, picked up. Later, up later, Isaiah picks up on other nations. Mm -hmm. But he's just making the point that God is going to have a great ingathering. And these people, sincere of heart, are going to, to come with gifts. So this is the Great Commission in the Old Testament. Absolutely. The Great Commission in the Old Testament, David, was given at Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, God said, You will be for me a holy nation, a kingdom of priests sent forth throughout the earth to represent my holy name and to tell others of my generous salvation. Go ye therefore into all the world. <laughs> and they didn't do it. This is a profound mystery. Most Christians do not understand that the Jews, as a tribal nation, were merely selected as trustees of the gospel. Rather, Christians have been led to regard Jews as God having some kind of thing to do with a one group of people but leaving the rest of us out of the loop until we get to the cross and then all of a sudden God throws open the doors and we have the church age in which the Christians now have the gospel commission. But the truth is, God chose Israel as trustees of the gospel. When they failed, God raised up the Christian church. When they failed, God raised up the Protestants. And when they failed, God is going to raise up the 144,000. We have here the promotion of the remnant being selected out of each corrupt body and God starting over. And finally, there will be a group that will not fail. Well, that's because they don't last long. <laughs> well, I guess you can't under that kind of pressure. The 144,000, if they were to exist for several years, mm -hmm. you know, generations, they too would corrupt. But fortunately, they are sealed, so they can't corrupt. And the time period of their ministry is only three and a half years, so it's a very quick play, and God accomplishes in the end what he needed and wanted to do all along. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm hammering on Isaiah 18 because I want people to understand, I want our listeners to understand that God's selection of Israel, he never had one exclusive thought in his mind when he did this. He just needed messengers. He needed messengers. He needed people to both give a proclamation and a demonstration of his love. And Abraham and his descendants were the best that he had to work with at that point in time. And so he blessed them by giving them the opportunity to go out and share this with other people. God wanted a nation of baby Abrahams. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and look what where did, we are. <laughs> what did he get? Well... What has he gotten all along? I mean, I, you know, you can't be hard on the Jews because their history is no different than any other history. No different from ours. No different than the Moabites. Right. No different than the Assyrians. No different than the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, the Grecians, and the Romans. The, 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 the history of man 
is the same in every case. It's just the names and places and dates change. Mm -hmm. okay. the, old, the, the old carnal heart is the same all the way across. I want to go to uh, Isaiah 19. This is an oracle concerning Egypt. See, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt tremble before him, and the hearts of the Egyptians melt within them. Now watch what this says, verse 2. I will stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. Brother will fight against brother. Neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. The Egyptians will lose heart, and I will bring their plans to nothing. They will consult the idols and the spirits of the dead, the mediums and the spiritists. I will hand the Egyptians over to the power of a cruel master. A fierce king will rule over them, declares the Lord. The waters of the river, Nile, will dry up, and the riverbed will be parched and dry. The canals will stink, and the streams of Egypt will dwindle and dry up. The reeds and rushes will wither. Also the plants along the Nile at the mouth of the river. Now, uh, man, the, the, there's, this thing is full of things I've got to say. Time is getting away here. Uh, I want you to go jump down to verse uh, 11. Read verse 11. The officers of Zoan are nothing but fools. The wise counselors of Pharaoh give senseless advice. How can you say to Pharaoh, I am one of the wise men, a disciple of the ancient kings? Jump down to verses 13 and 14. The officials of Zoan have become fools. The leaders of Memphis are deceived. The cornerstones of her peoples have led Egypt astray. The Lord has poured into them a spirit of dizziness, and they make Egypt stagger in all that she does, as a drunkard staggers around in his vomit. Okay. We need to pick up a little bit of language here from Isaiah uh, that is most uh, applicable to understanding Revelation. Back in verse 2, the Lord says he's going to stir up Egyptian against Egyptian. This is civil war. Um, God is going to hand over to the Egyptians, hand the Egyptians over, I should say, to the Antichrist, to Gog. That's what the fierce king... Yes. The cruel, cruel master. Yes. In Daniel 8, remember the horn power? Is a cruel, stern-faced king. Mm -hmm. He's going to not let his captives go home. He's uh, indescribably abusive. This is a fierce king that will rule over them. And the contest of who will submit to his authority is what brings about civil war, Egyptian against Egyptian. Now, let me lift this out of Isaiah 19 and set it down in the sixth trumpet of Revelation 9. In the sixth trumpet, when Satan is physically upon the earth and many believe that he is God, he will demand control of every nation. And this great warfare where the four angels are released from the river Euphrates and a third of mankind is killed, this great warfare will be the civil war of the world. Here's how it works. I'm holding this globe in my hand and uh, we're looking here at the United States on the globe. Many believe in the United States at that time that the devil is God and he is calling for complete dominion over this territory. In order for the plagues to stop. In, well, he's a, he's, he has set up, he is setting up the mark of the beast. If you want to receive the necessities of life, you've got to join and be part and loyal to his government and worship according to the dictates of God. Many will be opposed. Sin is not homogenous, you know. Sinners don't always agree on right. things. <laughs> so in order to take control of the United States, 
and Canada and South America and China and India and Europe and Africa to take control of the world, Satan brings his followers into the, uh, a condition where they must militarily take dominion of the earth, take over control of the earth. This is the Civil War. Isn't it interesting that, that he has gotten people so bad and so wicked that he, the devil, can't even control them and well, make them do what he wants them to that's do? That's precisely the problem with sin in the first place. <clears throat> That's the whole problem with sin, is that it's uncontrollable. Mm -hmm. Once it gets started, it's and just the, like a cancer. And the number of mounted troops is 200 million. John heard the number. That's a lot of people. Well, if you took all the armies of the world today that are in uniform and put them all together in one football field, giant football field, the total of all armies is only 13 million. Well, there's what, 260 million people in the United States? Yeah. All right, so almost all the entire United States would be in uniform. Yeah, yeah. Now, you've got to understand that at the time of this warfare, the population of the earth will be uh, a third or a fourth less than it is now. Because of the uh, death is, caused the, by the, the... Trumpets. Right. Mm -hmm, asteroid impacts and the, the, other, the other judgments. So this 200 million then becomes a huge percentage of the world who are on Satan's side. Bearing arms. Bearing arms for the purpose of establishing and setting up the government of the devil. We are in for a serious sleigh, sleigh ride here. And... S-L-A-Y. Yes, <laughs> yes. Wait, wait. <laughs> oh, wow, wow. You didn't see that didn't, one coming. No, did I didn't. You hit me broadside on that one. So, so what the Lord is saying here is that he will pit Egyptian against Egyptian, brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. This war is going to be, under, under plan A, the Egyptians will lose heart. See, and succumb. And God is then going to put Gog, who is introduced, you know, in the time of Ezekiel. Well, won't, won't all ten of these do that? I mean, they'll, yes. all, they'll yes. all have the civil yes. war. They'll all yes. lose heart. They'll all quit. They'll yes. just give up. Yes. And then bingo. And, and you notice it's interesting here that God dries up the river, Nile, the great river of, uh, of Egypt. And by, by drying up, the great river, then there is nothing to restrict. There is no natural boundary to restrict this war from accomplishing its objectives. See, the River Nile divided uh, Egypt. It's in the way. It's in the way. <clears throat> so if you move it, then people can fight each other. That's or, right. or God's people can leave. Yes. And as we will see later on in Isaiah, that's precisely um, the whole point is that the, God makes a highway from Egypt to Assyria so that everyone can quickly escape. And in fact, verse 23. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and Assyrians will worship together. In that day, Israel will be the third, along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. Third, third, third. Now, if, if that doesn't destroy the myth of exclusivity, what, what does it take? Look at verse 18. In that day, five cities in Egypt will speak the, la the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the Lord Almighty. One of them will be called the city of destruction. <laughs> in that day, there will be an altar to the Lord in the heart of Egypt and a monument to the Lord at its, at its border. It will be a sign and witness to the Lord Almighty in the land of Egypt. Verse 21, so the Lord 
will make himself known to the Egyptians, and in that day they will acknowledge the Lord. They will worship with sacrifices and grain offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and keep them. Isn't that wonderful? What we have seen is that the Lord is going to bring about the destruction of the world, but the rescue of his people. And his people, get this, are not exclusively Israel. Israel would have made up only one-third of the picture. That's, that's blessed be Egypt, my people, verse 25. Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel, my inheritance. One last thing, we're just about out of time, David. In this next chapter, chapter 20, Isaiah had to run around naked. It's three years. Now, how would it look for some of the uh, evangelists on television <laughs> if they were really going to prophesy? David, we're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good time to stop, isn't it? <laughs> Seeing a totally naked man standing with sober and very embarrassing and brutally uh, stark um, appearance to deliver a message from the Lord would be a sight not soon forgiven, uh, forgotten. And uh, when we pick up with our next tape, we will discuss uh, Isaiah and God's calling him to three years of enormous humiliation and embarrassment as he appeared in public places and in assemblies totally naked. We'll talk about that when we pick up next time. It's been a joy to be with you. It's always a lot of fun to discuss God's Word, and uh, we wish our listeners now will pick up with chapter 20, and we will continue there with our next tape. May God bless you. Next tape. May God bless you. Next tape. May God bless you. Next tape. May God bless you.